All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Vicki. I am the temporary president of N4C, and Doug Stinson is here. He's the, the prior president, and we want to welcome you to this webinar that we're very excited to have. I know some people were asking about John, and I'm glad that it all worked out, and he's here with us today. So um, uh, Doug's going to talk to you for just a moment about camera clubs, if you don't already belong to one, and if you don't, you might want to think about it. So. Okay. Yeah, well, welcome to the seminar. Uh, hopefully you see on your screen uh, some good reasons for joining a camera club. One is just co camaraderie, enjoying lively conversation at meetings, conferences, field trips with others who share your interests. It's a great way to meet people who you know you have at least one thing in common. And then, of course, camera clubs are a great opportunity for learning gain new skills from expert speakers, such as the one we have today, from other club members and from events and publications. And many clubs will have different opportunities to provide you with feedback on your photos so you can prove. Uh, one way is in monthly competitions. If you like competitions, then uh, that's one, one way to do that is submit your images to competition. But uh, there's also opportunities in different formats like salons where there's just informal critiques and, of course, getting inspired by other photographers. Now, if you happen to reside in the greater San Francisco Bay Area, you can find a camera club near you by going to N4C. That stands for Northern California Council of Camera Clubs, N4C.org, and then click on clubs on the menu. And there's a little search function where you can type in your address and it will locate the nearest, the club nearest to you. So I hope to see those of you in one of our club meetings in the future. And of course, one of the benefits of joining the club is you will get uh, invitations to webinars such as this. So uh, that's all I have to say. So I'll turn it back to Vicki. I don't, I think you're muted, Vicki. There, that's better. Okay. Well, again, welcome, John. And we're excited to hear what you have to say. Uh, question, there are four parts, John has told me. And so at the end of each one, we will take some, some specific questions. And if we have some general things, we're going to save them for a little bit later, I think so. But put your questions in the chat. The chat is being monitored by Michelle. John's wife, and she will let us know how we're doing there. Okay. All right. Welcome, John. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's good to be here. Uh, before I get going in, Vicki, uh, maybe you could just chime in. <laughs> we should have chatted about this sooner. Um, how long do you want me to go for? I, I think we were talking about an hour. I just wanted to double check. Oh, uh, I thought it was uh, a good one and a half or so. Oh, well, we can. Good. Then I don't have to rush through anything. Yes, please don't rush. We we want to take it all in. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, I suppose there's a number of people who have never seen or heard of me uh, from your clubs, and I should probably just do a real quick roundup of who I am. I got started in photography when I was 10 years old, and I had found a camera, and I looked at it, and I thought, I wonder what's on that roll of film. And then I ended up just throwing it out and buying my own and starting to shoot as a kid. And this is not when everybody had cameras. And so I went to grade school and high school, taking pictures of my friends in sports and neighborhood and what have you. And then I got into it in college where they actually had a course on photography. And I took one class and I knew it was for me. And so I ended up getting my degree in photojournalism from Oregon State University. Uh, worked at a couple of newspapers in the process of getting the degree, uh, graduated to a bad economy. And so I had to grab a, a job at a camera store for a while. And I still pursued photography on my own, on my own projects for quite some time. Um, it was a number of years later that I got to work with a great photographer a lot of you will know about, Art Wolf. And he was doing the TV show Travels to the Edge. And he hired me to be part of the very small traveling crew that got to go to all sorts of great places. Our first trip was down to the Amazon. We went to Africa. We went to Alaska. We went to Antarctica. 
And then we went to a whole other places that didn't begin with the letter A. It went on for about three years. It was a lot of fun. And there was uh, no faster learning curve in my photographic career than when working very closely with another great photographer. Um, after that, I started teaching classes. And I remember Art asked me to teach the first photography class. And I thought, well, who am I to teach anyone else photography? I only have a degree and have been doing it for 20 years. I don't know that I have the credentials to teach other people photography. Um, but he said, no, you can go ahead and do it. And so I put together my first class and it went over really well. And so I continued teaching. And then I got hooked up with a company called Creative Live that I think a lot of you will know about. And throughout the 2010s, I taught, I, don't, I forget the number, but it's over 100 classes at Creative Live. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of you probably know the fact that I've taught different camera classes and a variety of different photography classes. And now I have broken free and I am recording and producing and selling classes myself through my own website, johngringo.com. And so if you want to see more about that, you can look me up on the internet. We've got a uh, monthly newsletter that goes out with articles and information and announcements about uh, new classes. And when we get back to doing workshops and tours, we'll have more announcements about that. So that's just my quick history. Now for today, I have a talk called Focus, Sharpen Your Skills. And that is partly because I recently wrote a book on focusing called 50 Things Photographers Need to Know About Focus. And four of these are four of the 50 topics in that book. And it's kind of fun doing them live with the uh, animations that I have because I can explain it, I think a little bit more clearly in some ways than you can in the books, but the books are good in other ways. And so some people like books, some people like live talks. So maybe we'll do a little bit of the best of both here. So I'm gonna get into the keynote here. And so I'm gonna make a few changes and see if we can uh, get this up and running. And so I think we have the title slide on. Give me a thumbs up, Doug, if uh, it looks good to you. All right, so this is called Focus, Sharpen Your Skills. And I wanna talk about four different focusing techniques and tools that we have for improving focus. And so we're gonna talk about these four different areas. Let's go ahead and start off with what I like to call intelligent focus. Now this doesn't really have a, um, a well-accepted name in the industry right now. And this is, you know, it's focus tracking, subject tracking. There's a lot of different tracking options that have come around. And a lot of it is due to the mirrorless cameras that we're using. So with intelligent focus, as I like to call it, it's basically a program that identifies what you want in focus and tracks it throughout the frame. And this goes by names that you might see in your various camera brands as subject tracking, face tracking, and eye tracking. Now, the reason this has come about with mirrorless cameras rather than SLRs, well, let's take a look at how SLR cameras work. We have light coming through a lens, got our aperture and all of that good stuff in there. Now an SLR reflex, reflex stands for mirror. So that means the light's getting bounced upwards so that you can see through it. And a little bit of the light is bounced downwards through the mirror into an autofocus sensor. Now the autofocus sensors that we've had in our cameras for the last 30 years have been rather rudimentary, you might say. They're very simplistic. They can tell if things are far away or close up, and that's about it. That's all they can do. Now with a mirrorless camera, we have all this light coming in through the lens and it's going straight to this image sensor. And the image sensor, well, these days they're anywhere between 20 and, mega, and 60 megapixels, which means they are gathering a lot of information. And with the increased processing power in the cameras, there's a lot that the camera can figure out about what you are trying to shoot and what's going on and how it's moving around. Now in the DSLR, yes, you can put your camera into live view. You do lose the view through the viewfinder, which is a really important part about uh, the whole process. Um, and there are many DSLRs that will give you subject tracking and an intelligent focus when you're in the live view mode, 
but sometimes they're more difficult to handhold and track action in that re regard. And so uh, they can do it, they're just not as good as the mirrorless cameras in a very general sense. All right, so the idea starting big is with subject tracking, which is anything you want. It can be any shape, any object you want, you should be able to track it. When you put your camera into a tracking mode, it's usually gonna give you some target, some box, and you would place that box over your particular subject. It might pop up with a frame, and as you move that subject around the frame, it's gonna to try to follow it. Now, if you move too quickly, it may not be able to follow it absolutely precisely. This is still uh, a technology in its infancy, and they've made great strides in the last few years. Um, but it just seems to be getting better and better with each uh, new generation of camera. And so the idea on this is that you can have a subject that's randomly moving around and the camera is gonna be tracking where that is and adjusting for it in real time. And the beauty is, is that you're gonna be able to get lots of photos that are perfectly in focus uh, with subjects that are very difficult to normally track in many cases. Now the tracking ability is going to vary a little bit on the actual subject speed, both the lateral speed, side to side, and this would uh, kind of be compounded with you panning, moving the camera from side to side, as well as its forward motion. How big is it in the frame? Uh, very small objects like a bird at a far distance is going to be very hard to track. There's not as much information for it to go on. Background separation is the focus difference between your subject and the background. If you have a small bird with kind of mixed colors on a mixed background very close to it, it's gonna be hard to identify that one particular subject because it doesn't really stand out from the background. Um, any sort of interference is an object that comes between you and your subject. And so if there's a referee that comes between you and the player that you're tracking, that can throw things off. It could be the trunk of a tree as you're panning from side to side. And so all of these are variables along with the camera you use and the firmware that is being run on it at this given moment as to how good your camera is going to do on this. There's been a number of cameras that have had firmware updates that have improved the focus tracking ability. So make sure your cameras have the latest firmware if you wanna get the latest, greatest performance from your particular camera. Now, the available tracking subjects that I have seen various cameras claim to be able to follow is the list uh, you see on screen here. And this is likely to grow exponentially in the next several years as they can identify more unique and particular subjects. Uh, there's a number of cameras that just have a general subject, which it'll do anything, but uh, the ones that it particularly identifies a subject, they understand the shape and the look of that particular subject and they're likely to do a little better job at tracking that subject if you can individually identify it. Now, some tips on doing this is if you are trying to capture in-focus pictures of moving subjects, you should probably have your camera in the continuous autofocus mode. And there's a variety of names like AFC, CAF, or Servo uh, that you need to have your camera in. And this is for tracking your subject forward and back. It's tracking their motion. This is what autofocus cameras have had for more than 30 years. You need to be able to separate your subject from the background. And this is gonna be easier to do with a long lens, with a wider aperture, with a greater focus separation between your subject and the background. The more separation you have, the easier your subject's gonna stand out, the easier your camera is gonna be able to follow that subject through around the frame. And then stabilization. A lot of cameras and lenses have stabilization and that's just gonna keep the framing of your subject a little bit more even and smooth and it's gonna make it a little bit easier to follow. A very long lens uh, with no stabilization might kind of be jittery and moving around quite a bit and it's not gonna be able to track quite as well in that regard. And finally, you just need to get to learn your camera systems. Uh, we could talk all day about Sony or Canon or Nikon or Fuji or anyone else, um, but they all work a little bit differently and the way that you use them is gonna be a little bit different. So I'm not able to go into that here, but it's something, uh, some, a homework assignment for you, you might say. Now, face tracking is just a little bit more specific version of this subject tracking that does look for faces. 
And this can either be the greatest feature you've ever used or the worst feature you've ever used. Uh, that's my experience with it, is it can both be great and bad. Uh, where it is great is in a situation like you're seeing here, where there's an individual subject that's clearly standing out from any other faces or objects in the frame. It's very easy for it to grab onto. Sometimes when you have multiple faces, it can be challenging because the camera doesn't know which face you want to focus on. It will typically go on the one that uh, seems the most dominant or maybe is the largest. And on some cameras, they allow you to very quickly change from one face to another face using one of the touch controls on the back of the camera or somewhere else on the camera. So that's a good feature that you should investigate and know about how to use if you are working with multiple people. One of the uh, fun and interesting ones, I think, is on Sony cameras, they have a face registration. And the way that I've always imagined this is that uh, you as the parent of, uh, well, I guess in this case, eight small children, uh, and you want to put them into your camera database so that your camera recognizes those faces and will prioritize those faces. So when they get up on the stage play and there's all these kids up on stage, your camera knows to focus on your child. Now, of course, as you see the numbers one through eight, you can see the dilemma if you have more than one child is you need to prioritize your children, which I'm sure many parents do already, but that is something I will let you do on your own. And so you can register your faces in there, adjust their priority, and then it will focus on the faces higher up on that priority scale. Now, if you wanna narrow in a little bit further, you can go to eye tracking. And this is obviously where it looks at the eye. Uh, there has been some problems with some cameras going more on the eyelash than the eye, and that's how exacting we're getting here, folks. Uh, so you do need to be very precise about where you get this set. Now, as far as the eye tracking, most of the cameras these days, the modern ones are doing a very, very good job. They do have some, uh, options in the menus that you can go for, for instance, eye auto, where it chooses the nearest eye to you, right eye and left eye options. Now, interestingly, because I do work with a lot of cameras, not all the brands are, uh, are consistent in what they think the right eye is. Sometimes it's the right eye that you see as the photographer. In other cases, it's the right eye of the person that you are taking the photograph of. And so just be aware of how your camera picks left eye and right eye. And sometimes they'll just have a nearest eye, which is probably the one that I would choose because that's usually one that you want as the one that is most in focus in a portrait. And so um, if you don't want that, well, then you need to make a small adjustment with that. So that is our focus tracking. Now be aware that most of this focus tracking that I've been talking about, whether it's with the face or the eye, is generally referring to tracking the subject around the frame, left, right, and up and down, and doesn't necessarily mean tracking it forward and back. And so that's where you need to have the focusing, that continuous focusing turned on. Now how well your camera tracks the subject left, right, and up and down is really gonna depend on your camera and the firmware running it. How good is it being able to pick out a subject? As far as the focusing of your subject, how quickly can your camera keep up with things? Well, that's gonna be controlled by your camera, what lens you have on it, and the focusing system within that lens, as well as the firmware that's running all of that operation on there. And so there's a number of things that could go wrong and a number of reasons why that could be that way. Uh, so be aware that there are several different places to look to try to look for where is the problem and then trying to address, uh, okay, well, how do I fix that particular problem? Okay, so Vicki, that's my last slide for this first part, intelligent focus. So maybe we'll take a look and see if there's any questions people have. They can, I think, put them into the comments or raise their hand, but I'll let you pop in and address okay. that. Well, I saw uh, I saw a few of them coming up and I think Michelle was going to choose some for us. Are you there, Michelle? Yes, yes I'm here. Hi, everyone. Um, forgive me if I'm getting any of the names, um, pronunciation a bit incorrect, but Kathy Lichtendahl, I think it is, um, had a question. Uh, these There's two questions and both of them relate to tracking. 
Um, so the first one is, do you have to keep the AF button depressed to keep focus tracking active? Hmm. This may be camera dependent. In many cases, no, it will track the subject even with no fingers on the camera. Now to actually focus on that subject, you will in most every case need to press the button down. I believe there are some cases where you can put cameras into always auto-focusing, which I usually don't recommend. And so uh, you could have a subject identified, it's following it around the frame, but it's not actually focusing on it generally until you press either your shutter release button or the AF on button on the back of the camera, depending on how you have your camera set up. Okay, and the second question was from Cynthia, um, and I believe it's been answered, but um, if you can clarify this, will tracking work for left to right movement as well as forward and back? Yes, tracking is mainly left, right, up and down within the frame. That's all of the questions I think for the time being. Um, Michelle, a couple of people had raised their hand. I saw have their hand raised and I now it went away. It did say two people have their hand raised. Um, I see them here. Doug Both Fletcher's. Fletcher, yeah. And Jamie Green, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think you need to um, allow them access for the hands. I don't think oh, I can do that from here. Okay. Let's see. They may need to be unmuted as well. Okay. Go ahead and unmute. Who did I just send that to? Doug, I think it was you. No, no, not not Doug Stinson. Uh, so they need to unmute themselves. Yeah. Hold down the space key or unmute your own. Just hold the space key down and you're muted. Okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah, this is Doug. Okay. You have a question, yeah. Doug? No, I don't. No. Okay. Doug Fletcher has a question. His hand is up. Doug Fletcher, can you unmute and let us know what you're thinking? Oh, he just took his hand down. Okay. And Jamie Green, same. For you. All right. Thanks. So, just a quick question, Johnny. Let's say you are taking a picture of a, a couple and um, you know you want to do the the tracking uh, with you know continuous focus um, would you recommend in that scenario using zone or what would you recommend in, in that scenario uh, with a couple it'd be a little bit tricky because if it is picking one of their faces and one of them is a little bit closer that could cause a problem with that other person being out of focus and so I would probably direct them to try to stay even to the camera, depending on what aperture you're shooting at. I, I'm still getting used to this new focus tracking. I, I, I love technology, but I'm still kind of old school in a lot of things that I do. And I would probably be just choosing a wider focusing bracket that kind of hit their torsos overall and their faces, uh, depending on how they're positioned and so forth. Uh, because with two people, I suppose, you know, you take the bride um, and make sure that it's on her. It, there are two different options. You can try both. I, I can't tell you off the bat which one is best for you. Uh, but I think one of those two options should serve your needs quite well. All right. Perfect. Thank you. John, just one more question. It's Michelle here. Yep. Um, from Dylan. Is tracking on all DSLR cameras or only the higher end models? The tracking on the DSLRs generally are on later end models of the last, say, five years, and it's really only in live view that they work. Now, the, uh, the catch 22 is that while DSLRs can track in live view, they are terrible in general at focusing in live view. Uh, so it's just something that doesn't work real well for fast moving subjects with DSLRs. If it's a slower moving subject, like someone walking pretty slowly, it'll be okay. But for sports photography, 
it just doesn't work with DSLRs. Um, and there's a little asterisk right up here. Uh, the Nikon D5, D6, Canon 1DX models, they're kind of in a separate category. That autofocus module at the bottom of the um, mirror housing in the DSLRs are of a very another higher level than most of the DSLRs out there. And so those are you know $6,000 cameras. And they had some more intelligent focusing, but they were not giving us as photographers great feedback. It was all kind of in the mojo, buried in the algorithm, and it was doing a good job to help it focus, and which is why those cameras were so popular with sports photographers, is that they were the best at the time. And now when it comes to tracking sports, uh, mirrorless has truly fully taken over uh, in the last year or so from DSLRs as being the kings and the best of it. Another question, more um, with accessories, um, not the camera itself. Do any filters adversely affect the function of the systems? Well, anything that affects the light coming in the camera might adversely affect it. Uh, anything that restricts the amount of light, a neutral density filter, a polarizing filter. Um, I don't think that it's going to harm it a lot, but it might take the performance down by 10 or 20% because it's taking the light level down by 10 or 20%. I've not done any testing, but this is just kind of intuitively what makes sense to me. Uh, I think it's generally going to work though. And I think that's all of them for this point in time, John. If there's any others, um, if anyone wants to send me a direct message and we can get to them a little bit later, if there's any that I've missed. All right. I think I'll just go ahead and get back to the next section, which is hyperfocal distance. Let me go ahead and see if I can get this uh, set up properly. All right, so hyperfocal distance. So I know some of you know this some, some of you might know this pretty well. For other people, this is, um, I think it's one of the coolest terms. If you want to impress your non-photography friends, uh, just mention the word hyperfocal distance and they're going to they're gonna be really impressed with how much you know, just the fact that you know these complicated words. And so let's talk a little bit about how you set the hyperfocal distance, what it is and why it's important. So it is the focusing distance to achieve the maximum depth of field, which is another way of saying if you want as much in focus, this is where you set your focus point in order to get as much in focus for a particular photograph. This is notably particularly important to a landscape photographer, uh, possibly an architectural photographer, somebody who has a scene with everything in focus and they want everything to be in focus in front of them. So. Let's go back through coming up some of our photography basics. We know that when we focus on a subject, depth of field will extend and kind of peter out after a little bit. And so we have a limited range of depth of field. When you focus up close, it's a pretty shallow depth of field. And when you focus far away, it's a much greater depth of field of range from the beginning to the end. And somewhere in between the near and the far is your hyperfocal distance, this little magical mystery point where if you set your lens to that particular point, set a particular aperture, you will get everything from the foreground to the background into an acceptably sharp photograph. And the key is, well, how do we do that? Well, first off, let's think about times where we don't need to do it. And the first is when you have distant subjects. Now, this Bhutan monastery is much closer than the mountains or the clouds in the background, but relatively speaking, photographically speaking, it's all pretty far away and we don't need to worry about hyperfocal distances with far away subjects like this. So things, I don't know how to, I don't want to put a number on it, but you know, 100 meters and more beyond, generally you don't have to worry about it. Now, it's just not going to be possible in a single shot to get something extremely close up and at infinity, all in focus at the same time, um, except for the topic we're gonna to talk about next, which is focus stacking, but we're working with one shot technique here. How do we get it right in one shot? So there's gonna be a point at which something is too close to the lens and it's no longer possible. Um, when does it cross over being not possible to being possible? Well, it depends a little bit on the lens and you'll see more about that as we get through this section. 
So this is going to work best with wide angle lenses. This is where it's most practical, where you want something that's relatively close, like those flags right to the left, or maybe a foot, foot and a half away from the camera, to things off into the distance to be in focus. And so this is an image you know, where we are using the hyperfocal distance to make sure that we get everything in focus in the photograph. It's very useful, as I say, with landscape photography, very useful when you're shooting vertical so that you can get something right down at your feet or very close in front of you, as well as the distant horizon and items in the uh, horizon in sharp focus. Excuse me, John? Yes. A uh, number of people have commented that your voice is pretty soft. Is there anything you can do to increase the volume? Yeah, let me jump in. Uh, change my audio settings and crank it up another level here. Hopefully this is better for people. It's definitely better. Okay. So uh, anytime you have close up subjects and far away subjects, this is when we want to be using the hyperfocal distance. Now let's make sure I'm on the right screen here. All right, so the goal here is acceptably sharp focus from the foreground to the background. And I know what some of you might be thinking right now, hold on, wait a minute. Those are some, those are some catchy words there. What do you mean by acceptably sharp focus? I think we all know that this is a term that may vary from person to person. Well, this is gonna go along with what we normally think is in focus, and it's gonna vary according to all the other factors that depth of field is affected by. The focal length of the lens, the aperture you're shooting at, as well as the circle of confusion. Now, I know we are winding our way deeper and deeper into the weeds here, and you may feel like you are in the circle of confusion right now, but it is a way of measuring sharpness. We need to be able to do this mathematically, and so you don't need to learn this math or memorize it, but there is math behind it, which always makes me a little bit more faithful about uh, something is really going on here, and there is a way to measure and calibrate this. And so if you want to measure where the hyperfocal distance is, you can figure it out yourself by multiplying the focal length by the focal length, putting that over the aperture of your, you have chosen. And then we need to multiply that by what we consider to be in focus, which is our circle of confusion. So let's talk about the circle of confusion. All right, what is the circle of confusion? It's the maximum size of a projected point of light considered to be in focus. And so if you can think about a tiny spot of light out in the universe that you're gonna photograph and it comes through your lens and it gets projected onto your sensor, how big can that be or how small does it need to be to be considered in focus, okay? And remember, you know, when we set a particular aperture opening on our lens, where we focused is gonna be very sharp and then it kind of tapers off. It's, uh, it gets less and less sharp and at a certain point, it's unacceptable and nope, now it's out of focus. And the standard I'll have to admit has gotten a little bit more stringent as we have higher resolution sensors and cameras uh, with greater resolving ability. So let's take a look at the way the light comes through a lens. And so it comes through a lens, it goes through an aperture, and it is projected onto our sensor. That, that is our focal point. Now I'm gonna draw the lines beyond this just to uh, show what it would look like if we could move the sensor back and forth. Now the circle of confusion is the size of that spot of light that is focused on your sensor. Now in theory, we could move the sensor forward and back in this particular instance and still have everything in sharp focus because our circle of confusion is not this infinitely small point. It's a reasonable size dot, you might say, and we can move the sensor back and forth and we can't really do that. But what we could do is we could move the subject a little bit forward and a little bit back. So if you could imagine focusing on a subject that is 10 feet away and then they move one inch closer or they move two inches further back they're still gonna be considered in focus because there's a little bit of wiggle room, you might say. Now, as you stop your aperture down, you get more wiggle room. You can move your subject a foot forward or a foot back. You have a lot more leeway with where that subject is in your composition forward and back and still having it in focus. If we were to look at a sensor with uh, 
these are very large pixels for illustrative purposes. A spot of light comes into our sensor. Ideally, this spot of light would be the same size as a pixel. It could properly illuminate it and it doesn't have any bleed over. If it's smaller than the pixel, well, as long as it's triggering that pixel and recording that light there, we're okay. Where we start getting into problems is when we have a larger circle of confusion and it starts to bleed over to other pixels and starts affecting them and changing their color and the information that they are recording. If it's bleeding over quite a bit, well, then it's not gonna look very good. And so the smaller the circle of confusion, the more precise you are about sharpness and how everything's going to be. But if you draw it too small, it, it's, it's just not necessary um, for what the application may be. Now, there's a lot of different ways for uh, calibrating and ranking these circles of confusion, but this is generally based on information that unfortunately is over a hundred years old at this point, where the technology was very different than we have today, but it's these standard scales and charts that we have grown up with that haven't really changed for the most part. And this is based off of printing a photograph in an eight by 10 size, viewing it from 10 inches away with a 60 degree angle of view and judging whether the photograph is sharp or not. That is the way the general focus charts have been developed. The focus scales on lenses have been developed. And I don't think I need to be the person to let you know that technology has improved in the last hundred years when it comes to image sharpness in photography. And so I went scouring for information on, well, what is the circle of confusion for various standards? Now, the first one I find is the general one that is used for full frame cameras in determining where the hyperfocal distance is, how do you determine whether an image is sharp? And it's 0 0.03 of a millimeter. You don't need to memorize this number. We're just gonna compare some numbers and some other things and you'll get a feel for where things lay. Now, mobile phones, as we all know, have very small screens, and you do not need an image that is nearly as sharp to look good on one of those. So the circle of confusion for a mobile phone is just 0.1 of a millimeter. It's three times less than a full-frame camera. Full-frame camera needs to have pretty good standards. Well, somebody that has higher standards than regular full-frame cameras is the ASC, the American Society of Cinematographers. So this is the guild that Hollywood works with for filming movies. And while I don't work with them directly, I imagine they have their own focus charts and their own depth of field charts and hyperfocal charts and rankings of lenses. And they have just a little bit tighter standard than us regular folk for full frame cameras. Now, 1.5 crop frame cameras, like all your general Fujis and your crop frame Canons and Sonys and Nikons and what have you, actually have a little bit smaller circle of confusion because their frame is smaller, their pixels are smaller. So you need to have a different circle of confusion if you're calculating things for a crop frame. Next up, and I don't like to throw too many brand names in here, but Fuji does do something kind of interesting. They have a depth of field chart that I'm gonna show you a video example of here in a minute. And they have two different standards that you can go by. You can do the film standard, which is kind of similar to the full frame standard, but adjusted for crop frame sensor and the way Fuji sees the world and what they determine to be in focus. And it's a uh, zero or 0 0.014. Now, if you were to just print a large poster, six feet by four feet in size, you would need to have a circle of confusion of 0 0.004 to make that look proper. So if you said, well, where does my hyperfocal point need to be for this type of print? Well, you need to know the final use of it if you really wanna figure it out, absolutely. And then finally, Fuji has another pixel standard for their depth of field chart, which is even more exacting if you wanna be very, very precise. And so I'm gonna be showing you some depth of field charts and you can kind of pick and choose where you want to be. And you can choose to be at a little higher standard than the default setting that is already there. It depends on how exacting you want to be. What do you consider to be in focus versus out of focus? And it's all based on this formula that you can play with to your heart's content.
So here is a hyperfocal distance chart. And this is telling you where you need to focus with a particular lens at a particular aperture to have the hyperfocal distance set on your lens. Now, for the most part, we're going to be dealing with wide angle lenses. Stop down a bit so that you can get a lot in focus. And let me just show you what it looks like at f22, where you need to focus and how much is in focus with different lenses. And you'll see why this works well with wide angle lenses. Now I'm gonna show you in red, the focusing point, and then the blue marker is the nearest thing that is in focus all the way up to infinity. So you can see with an ultra wide 11 millimeter lens, stop down to F22, focused at, what is that? 20 centimeters in front of the lens, you'll get everything from 10 centimeters to infinity in acceptable focus. Um, and as we move our way out, you can see that this works very well with wide angle lenses. And then as you get up to 50 in the telephotos, uh, this hyperfocal distance doesn't have as many payoff returns, you might say. If you use an 800 millimeter lens and you focus a kilometer away, everything from a half a kilometer to info infinity will be in focus. And so uh, this gets a little bit confusing. And so there's been a lot of simple terms and phrases that have been used in the past. I, uh, I've heard these a lot. I might be actually guilty of, of saying these things a few times. And so some bad advice that you may have heard before is to focus one third into the frame. Now, it's not totally bad advice. It's just not totally right advice. And so what does it mean to focus one third into the frame? Let's look at some examples. Well, in this particular composition, one third up from the bottom, well, that's like the closest thing in the scene. And if I focus there, that's not the hyperfocal distance. Hyperfocal distance is gonna be somewhere between the nearest and the farthest. It's somewhere out on the sand, somewhere in between these rocks in the foreground and the rocks in the background. So that doesn't work out for one third into the scene, nor does this one because the horizon, which is essentially infinity, is one third into the frame like this. Now, this actually does work here in this a little bit more normal composition, you might say. If you were to focus at about this one third mark where the red arrows are, then yeah, that's pretty close to where the hyperfocal distance would be for this particular image. So not totally right advice, not totally wrong. It's just, it's, not the best, okay? Now, some people have switched this out and said one third into the scene. So one third into your composition depth wise is where you should focus, all right? Well, that doesn't always work so well either. Take this composition, all right? So what's the furthest thing into the frame? Well, this mountain that I've measured off at about five miles away. So if we're supposed to focus one third into the scene, well, that's one third of five miles, which means I'm supposed to focus at 1.665 miles away. Check your lenses, folks. They do not have focusing marks for 1.66 miles, all right? What if we want the sun in focus, all right? That's 93 million miles. What's one third? And how do you focus on one third of 93 million miles? I don't know. My lens doesn't have those markings. So this is just not totally right advice. And so this focus extends one third in front and two thirds behind the plane of focus is not totally right advice. Let me show you an example. And I'm going off of standard depth of field charts. You can look these up yourself if you want. Take a 35 millimeter lens, focus to five meters. Focus will extend to two and a half meters in front and to 200 meters in the back. When I run my math on that, that's 1% in front and 99% behind your plane of focus. All right, let's take a 200 millimeter lens, focus on five meters again. This time we're gonna get four millimeters in front and four millimeters behind. So you're getting a 50-50 ratio of what's in focus. And so it can really vary depending on the lens and the focusing distance that you're at. So, when you're focusing on a particular point, you're gonna get something a little in front and a bit more behind it in focus, generally speaking. As you stop your aperture down, 
you get more in front and more in back. And this continues as you stop your aperture down. When you close it down all the way, it may not reach infinity. And if you notice that infinity is not in focus, the mistake that some people make is to just focus on infinity. And what they've done is they've just wasted a whole lot of in focus area. If they were to move that focus point forward so that the back end of their focus zone hit infinity, they would then be at the hyperfocal distance, the place where they are getting the maximum amount in focus. Now, in order to do this, you're going to have to be like Luke Skywalker in Star Wars in the Death Star. You're going to have to go manual on this one. Uh, this is a very difficult one to autofocus on because there may not be an object for you to focus. It's going to be easier for you to manually focus this. Now, some tools that you might need that will be handy here is a magnifying glass. So if you have a zoom in option, which pretty much all cameras will have, will be very handy. If you're in a DSLR system, you're going to want to use live view so that you can magnify on the back of the camera. If you have depth of field preview, that's going to be a handy feature to have programmed to one of your buttons. It's going to be very useful in one of our uh, techniques coming up here. Now, I've uh, figured out five different ways that you can set the hyperfocal distance. And I'm going to go through all five. You do not need to use all five. You do not need to memorize all five. Um, but I would pay close attention to the last one because I think it's the easiest. But let's just kind of work our way through the problem here. First up, you could just visually estimate it. And I do this from time to time when I feel pretty confident about my estimation abilities. And what you do is you focus on infinity, you focus up close, and you just put the focus somewhere in between. And this can work for subjects that aren't too critical that are a little bit further away. And so you set your lens to manual focus, you focus on infinity, you see where that puts you on the focusing ring, you then focus up close, and then you just kind of put it somewhere between the two. And with a small enough aperture, yeah, you're probably going to be fine. Once again, this is just an estimate. So we're not doing anything very exacting here. Next up is magnified infinity. So this is where we're going to magnify and take a close look at our foreground to get it in focus. We're going to have the lens stop down and we're going to move our magnification point to infinity. And we're going to adjust focusing very slowly as we are stopped down on the lens until the background starts to get in focus. And then as soon as it starts to get there, we're gonna stop. So once again, walking through this process, we're gonna magnify in to look at the foreground. We're gonna focus on the foreground. I'm then gonna move the focus box to infinity. I'm gonna stop the aperture down by pressing my depth of field preview button. And I see that it's a little out of focus, so I adjust focus just a little bit until it comes in focus. And I know that I have a focus point set that will reach to infinity. All right, so key things is stopping the lens down pretty far, probably f11, 16, or 22. Uh, magnify the distance and then set the focus to the closest distance while keeping the far distant subjects in focus. And so that one might take a little bit of practice on your part. It really helps working with the camera on a tripod so that it's nice and steady in that case. A third way of figuring out the hyperfocal distance is to use this hyperfocal chart. Um, and there's a lot of these that you can look up online. This one, uh, you can download this and look at this. Now, remember, these numbers are from 100 years ago. And so they may not be as accurate as you would like. Let's just take a for instance. I like the 24 millimeter lens. Uh, let's say a 24 millimeter lens at f16 we would focus at 1.2 meters to get that hyperfocal distance. And now what we might say is, okay, well, we have subjects in there that we want in focus, but you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna stop down to F22 just to make sure we're really covering ourselves so that we're getting a lot in focus. And I know some of you are thinking about diffraction and that is a topic for another time. We're just talking about depth of field. So if you wanted more depth of field, you could just stop down to the next number. All right, another option that works for some people, depending on their equipment, is scale focusing. Now, a lot of, a problem that I have with a lot of modern lenses is that they don't have focusing charts on them. And this is where like an old school Leica lens or even some of the more modern lenses will have a focusing scale on them to let you know where you are focused at. 
Now, the better ones of these will have a hyperfocal scale along the bottom. Some do, some don't. You'll have to take, it your lens, take a look at your lenses to see if they have this. I think Leica lenses do this better than anybody. These are manual focus lenses, and a lot of their users use the hyperfocal scale for zone focusing for street photography, for instance. So they have really nice, this is, this is the uh, hallmark of what a good focusing scale looks like. Now, if your lens does have a focusing scale, it might look a little something like this with its depth of field scale down below it. So let's go ahead and focus on 10 feet. If we set an aperture of f11, that means everything from seven feet to 15 feet will be in focus at that focus point with f11. Let's focus on infinity at f11, and we can see we get everything from 30 feet to infinity and beyond infinity in focus. And we've kind of wasted some of our focus here if we're trying to get as much as we can, because it's going beyond infinity. Now, another little side note, be aware that many of your lenses will focus beyond infinity. And what that is for, it's for thermal expansion in your lens. It's for when it gets hot and cold and the tolerances are slightly different. And so it's advisable to manually focus your lens on infinity and check it on your scale to see where infinity really is. Is it a little to the left of the line or a little to the right of the line, or maybe it's perfectly right on the line. So be aware of that. Now, if you did want to use F11 to get the maximum depth of field, this is your hyperfocal point. At F11, it's focused at about 30 feet. It'll get everything from 15 feet to infinity in focus. But if you really wanted the maximum depth of field, you would stop down to F22, focus on about 15 feet, and it would focus would reach from seven feet to infinity as far as what would be in focus. Your hyperfocal distance is then 15 feet. And so what we're doing is we're lining up the hyperfocal mark on the focusing scale with our F22 or our smallest aperture little mark on the bottom scale. Now you can actually see this in some cameras. Fuji has a depth of field scale that I love because it mimics what happens when you focus up closer. It shows you where your focus point is as well as your depth of field, which gets larger as you focus further away and shallower as you focus close. Here's an actual video of me focusing a Fuji camera. And you can see that focusing scale down on the bottom. It grows as we focus out to five meters. If we were to focus out to infinity, we're throwing away half of our in-focus potential area. So it would be better to move back to around five meters so that everything from three meters roughly to infinity is in focus. We can focus up very close and you can see very shallow depth of field, especially as we get to our closest region, which is just about 10 centimeters away. If we focus at one meter away and then we start closing our aperture down, we're gonna get more depth of field and that depth of field is gonna extend all the way to infinity. We can move focusing around close up, it gets narrower. When we focus on infinity, of course, it gets bigger. If we focus on infinity, we're throwing away a lot of potential in focus area. If we wanted the hyperfocal distance, we'd focus on about one meter. The in focus area would reach from a half meter all the way to infinity. Now, as you zoom in, we all know that you get shallower depth of field as you zoom in on a lens or use a more telephoto lens. And so you can see that depth of field area reduce there. And once again, as you move that focus point around, it's going to shrink and grow according to those three different standards, which all affect our depth of field. But a scale like this can really help out in figuring out where is this hyperfocal distance. And it's something that I think we're going to see on more on more cameras. I think Fuji does it best right now. Some of the new Canon ones have a pretty good one on it. And um, there are some focusing scales on the other cameras, but they aren't showing the depth of field the way this does. All right, here's my favorite way. This is double veneer point. This is the easiest way to figure things out. All right, let's go back to the basics here. So we have something in the foreground we want in focus and something in the background, and we want to find this mythical hyperfocal point that is somewhere between the two. Well, generally, the things in the distance are usually infinity, so we're not going to worry too much about that. But this hyperfocal distance is known as the H point, and it will have a focus that reaches to the H divided by two point. So focusing on H will yield equal focus 
on h over 2 as infinity. So what that means is your close-up subject and your distant subject will be of equal focus. They're equally sharp in focus. All right, well, how do we figure this out? Well, we estimate where that near subject is, and we double that to figure out our hyperfocal distance. If you recall this chart here, I, granted I rounded off some numbers in here just for simplicity, but let's take the 35 millimeter lens. When you focus at two meters, it's gonna be equally in focus at one meter as it is at infinity. And so stop your lens down to a small aperture and see if it reaches infinity and you will be at the hyperfocal point. All right, so I'll take a subject like this. What's the closest thing to me in the frame? Well, it's obviously this very lower part of the frame and then I'm going to double that and that's gonna be where I want to focus. I wanna focus on the flowers in the foreground as the closest element. I'm going to double that distance. Uh, in this case, it's probably two feet to that closest subject and probably four feet to where I was setting the focus point. What's closest in the frame? What's double that distance? And that's where I'm gonna focus. And so this is something that you can do very easily out in the field as you get good at estimating distances. So once again, what you'll do is estimate the near subject. It might be a foot, two feet, three feet in front of you, and then simply double that for your hyperfocal distance. And that's where you're gonna manually set your lens. Now you could autofocus it on that point if there's something to focus on. But as I say, I kind of like doing things old school and just turning that lens manually and getting that point in sharp focus. So then it will extend equally from the foreground to the background. But the final thing is, what aperture do I need to use at that point? Well, this is where you're gonna to have to do some testing. Uh, I will typically shoot two or three different photos to see. I would prefer not to get into the diffraction territory in F22 and 32, so I might try F11 and 16, see if it works out, magnify the playback images and see if things are as sharp as I like. And then I might try some other settings at F16 or F22, and maybe I'll just shoot it all in the field, bring it home and take a look at it on the larger computer in front of me so I can be a better judge of what's going on. So that double the near point, I think is the easiest one to work with. And it just leaves up in the air, well, what exact aperture do I need? And with a few different shots, you can cover your bases very easily for that. So there you go, folks. Those are my five solutions on how to find the hyperfocal distance. And now I'm gonna check back in to see if everyone has gone to sleep or has questions. Um, there are some questions, John. I've got a whole list of them down here. Um, we'll start with um, the final point that you were just making um, about double the near point. Jean uh, Bardi, I think it is, uh, said higher end Canon film cameras had automated this by using a three step routine where you put the camera on autofocus. And number one is it focuses in the near point, number two focuses on the far point, and then number three is you frame and shoot. Um, I hope this makes sense to you. Um, the camera will set the aperture to cover the distance and shoot. Does this feature exist on newer cameras? No, that feature does not. I am trying to remember the name of that feature um, because it was on their mode dial on the top of the camera. Now, the caveat to that system is that it only worked with items that were in the focusing points that you had in the frame. And as we all know, a lot of DSLRs have focusing points kind of hovered in the middle of the frame. And so it wasn't able to focus on something up there and down in the bottom. It was just looking at the focus points and what was in with them. And so it was, um, it was, it was, it was going to be a problematic mode that was not going to get used unless people really understood the, how it really worked. I think that might be a good system that some company could employ in the future. No camera company does that to my knowledge. Um, working further back about the hyperfocal distance, um, we've got some questions there. Lorraine wants to know, can you trust focus peaking for hyperfocal distance? 
Focus peaking, that's a good question because focus peaking, what it's showing you is it's showing a shimmering highlight of areas in strong contrast. Things that are in focus generally have strong contrast, but things that are slightly out of focus may also have strong contrast if they just have naturally strong contrast. So it is not to be fully believed, but is a reasonable estimation. Um, and we've got a number of questions, John, on um, the circle of confusion and both with non-full frame sensors, so say, for instance, the micro four-thirds or a 1.5 or 1.6 crop, um, as well as the circle of confusion, how that would be impacted if you had a full frame camera but you were using a crop factor within that full frame camera. Okay, well, I guess that last part's pretty easy. Whatever your final format is, is where you would have to figure out your circle of confusion for figuring out your depth of field. So if you are cropping, you are essentially using a crop frame camera at that point. Now, the, um, the first part of your question was, um, please restate the first part of it if you could. Um, what would the circle of confusion be for non full frame cameras? Like, how would you determine what it is? You, you've got the chart there for the full frame, right? Uh, well, uh, you could go to a number. Of, there's a number of different websites that deal with depth of field charts online, and they will have additional information there uh, that might talk to medium format cameras. Uh, if you were going to be using the Olympus. Well, OM system, uh, micro four thirds system, it's going to need to be more exacting than the 1.5. If you look at the numbers, you can actually mathematically just kind of figure out what they would be. Uh, they would be double the standard of full frame for micro four thirds. And then they would be a little bit looser for medium format. Uh, but once again, this is designed for eight by 10 print viewed at 10 inches. And your setting might be more exacting or less exacting depending on how your images are gonna get viewed. Uh, this was just kind of an industry standard that has stuck around and we should actually be having higher standards with our high megapixel cameras these days. I think that answers the question um, or the questions. The next one is actually a, a little bit of a more detailed question. It's about the depth of field preview button, but it's on one of your um, cameras that you know quite well, which is the X-T3. Uh, Mila wants to know where or how does she identify um, the depth of field preview button on the X-T3? Okay, I'm going off my best memory on this one. I believe the X-T3 normally keeps the aperture open when you are viewing through the lens. And as soon as you press halfway down on the shutter release, it actually stops the aperture down to its working aperture. And you should be able to see that by kind of doing a selfie and looking straight into the lens and press halfway down on the shutter release with a small aperture like F16 or F22. And you'll be able to see whether it's doing it right then and there. And I believe that's the way that Fuji's work. I think that's all of the questions for the time being um, for that's, this section. That's good because I still have a fair bit of material to go through. So I think I'm going to have to uh, keep her moving and dive into focus bracketing. All right, let me just make this work again. Okay, so focus bracketing, what is it? Well, it's a series of images with the focus point in a different position. The goal here is to achieve a massive depth of field. Now, this is slightly different than focus stacking, which is the software that is typically used for blending images together. And so you'll see both terms and it's the bracketing that we're doing in the camera, kind of like we do exposure bracketing. We're gonna do focus bracketing in this case, shooting a series of pictures at different areas and then kind of combining them later on in post-production. Now, the reason that we might wanna do this is to increase the depth of field. We might wanna increase the sharpness of a particular image or increase control over the in-focus area. I'll have an image that I am particularly showing you uh, that 
explains this very clearly in a minute. All right, so the idea is that we're gonna capture slices from near to far, and these slices need to overlap so that there's sharpness between all of them, so that when they come together, it's all going to be in focus. And so once again, uh, rather than using hyperfocal distance to get everything in focus, uh, we're gonna use multiple photos. So we know we have a limited range of depth of field, whether we focus up close or further away. Yes, we can do our hyperfocal distance, but sometimes it's just not sharp enough at the very edges of that hyperfocal distance. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus at several different points, have enough depth of field so that there's overlap between all the slices and then combine all the slices together. So each of these is gonna have a little bit of depth of field. And then we're gonna take those into a software program and we're gonna combine them. We're dealing with the shooting this out in the field part. We're not gonna be dealing with the software part here in this particular talk. So how are we going to do this? Well, there's two different ways. Uh, many cameras, most new cameras these days have a focus stacking capability built in, uh, but you can also do it manually. And one of my favorite photos down in California was done manually before I had a camera that had this feature. I knew it was possible at the time, and it probably wasn't for five years before I had this in camera. So if you don't have this in your camera, not to worry, you can still use this out in the field yourself. Now, if you do have this feature in the camera, there is gonna be some primary controls. The first is the number of exposures. How many exposures do you want to shoot? And the correct number is the fewest to get the job done. You wanna make sure that the front object is in focus as well as the back object. It could be anywhere from two images to a thousand images. The increments, this is how much the lens changes from one shot to the next. This is something you are definitely gonna to have to test with your particular camera system. I work with a lot of systems. In some cases, I generally set it at one and two. In other cases, I'm setting it at nine and 10. And so it really depends on what you shoot and a number of other variables. Now, we have a large number of apertures we could be using, but generally we want a lot of depth of field. That's what we're trying to do here in this whole process. But we also want to avoid diffraction, which is what happens when we close our lenses down to f32 and 16. So typically, I'm using f8 to f11 in most of the stacking that I'm doing. All right, now there are going to be variables to all of these settings. It's going to have to do with the subject size, the distance to the subject, the focal length, aperture. So all the normal culprits that affect your depth of field are going to affect how you set your camera up and these other controls. Now there's a few other things that you might have options. There might be a delay option. This might be handy if you're in a studio working with strobe units that need to recycle, um, or if there's vibrations on your camera and you just wanna delay so that it's uh, not picking up any movement of you pressing the button on the camera. Smoothing, I don't like this feature because this indicates that your camera is in some sort of automated exposure and you are shooting a series of images that are gonna be combined into one image. In my mind, that means you should have your camera set to manual. If for some reason you wanted to have your camera set to automatic, this would get those images a little bit closer together in exposure. And so I don't think you'll need this. It's possible you could get some exposure changes with focus breathing on some lenses as they start focusing up very close, they start letting in less light and that could cause a problem. The electronic shutter is a Shutter without mechanical motion, which means you're less likely to get vibration or sound. Uh, it's possible that you're gonna get distortions uh, with electronic shutters, but we're focusing and we're gonna be working with subjects that are not moving. So distortions are highly unlikely in this case. Now for setting things up, uh, you wanna get your aperture set, which is gonna be a maximum depth of field without diffraction. And that's gonna vary from lens to lens, but F8 to F11 is pretty common. You wanna set up the number of exposures. A lot of time, I like to see if I can get it done in five or 10 shots. A lot of times I need many more than that. Increment or step size, you're just gonna to have to do a test, uh, generally in the middle of the range, and then see if you need to up it or lower it, depending on how the images come out. All right, so here we are in the studio. If we focus with shallow depth of field, we're obviously getting very little in focus. If we stop down, well, we don't have all of our subjects in focus, and the background's very out of focus. If we focus in the middle of the scene, you might say, our foreground subject and our background subject are horribly out of focus here, even though we're stopped down 
pretty close to the hyperfocal point, it's not enough to keep everything in sharp focus. In this particular case, I'm shooting at f11. I'm doing 50 shots, much more than I typically like to do, but sometimes you need to do a lot of shots. On the first image, I'm setting the camera up to focus on the nearest subject. And for cameras that have this feature built in, they tell you just to set up the camera with it focused on the nearest subject and it will just move the lens uh, until it runs out of shots. And so in this case, after 50 shots, I have something beyond my last subject, beyond the background in focus. When I take those into the software, I'm using Helicon software, that's Helicon software. I stack all these images up together and I get incredibly sharp focus from the foreground to the background. Now, the different focus stacking programs out there are gonna have a lot of parameters for adjusting a variety of features, which is more of a talk for software. We're not gonna get into it now, but this is one way of getting a subject in sharp focus from foreground to background. And it can do a much, much better job, as you can see focus shifting on top compared to a single shot setting the hyperfocal distance. Uh, down in point rays, I found some very interesting trees and I tried to set the hyperfocal distance in this distance here to get everything in focus. And then I decided to shoot it with a better aperture reading like F11 or so and adjust focus manually. And so as I adjust focus manually throughout, I ended up taking about a dozen shots and I just kept them in my Lightroom category or catalog for about three or four years until I actually had the software to put it all together to get one nice sharp image. And if you're wondering, well, is it really worth all the time and effort? Well, it depends on the details. Uh, let's look at the details of a focus stacked image in all its great sharpness and compare that to a single shot image. Once you get in close enough, yes, you can see a very clear difference. Shooting a subject in a single shot at f2.8 yields pretty shallow depth of field. But suppose I want the foreground and the background of the, the, the foreground leaf and the background leaf on this flower to be in focus. Well, I stop down and then I get the background in focus, which I didn't really want. By using the stacking technique, I could just keep it focused in on that little flower, but still keep that background out of focus. And so this is what I meant when I said earlier on, better control of the in-focus areas. And so if you want to keep that field of flowers in focus from the foreground to the background, yeah, try a shot at F22, see how well you do. And then if it's not too windy out and your subjects aren't moving, you can do a focus stack where you can put all of them together to get really sharp focus from foreground to background. And so it's a helpful technique, but your, your subjects do need to be steady. So you do be, need, need to be very careful about wind and any sort of movement. Now, strangely enough, there is a couple of cameras, the Z6 and Z7, and not the Z6 II and Z7 II, that would show you a peaking stack image, which would show you how you were doing with your stacking of your images and how much you were getting in focus. So you could see in the field whether you were doing a good job at judging how many shots you needed, how much depth the field was set, is there enough images going from front to back? And why this is not included on the latest generation of Nikon Z cameras, I don't know. There is no other company that has this. It's just a quirk in time that they did this and now they took it off. Uh, so if you happen to own one of those two cameras, uh, it's a little bonus for you. Now, if you wanna do this manually yourself, you can. Uh, you're just gonna need to manually focus. And what you wanna do is you manually focus on the nearest point and you're gonna adjust focus just a little bit further away on, sequ on sequential shots until the far point is in focus. And so you may need to do some testing out on how many images and what aperture and how far apart your focusing is on each of these to do this. Now for a while, there was uh, a number of tools out on the market. I'm sure they're still out there, but now that a lot of cameras have features built into them, we don't need to buy these other tools. There are, they are out there. And if you do want to get, well, pixel peeping perfect about this, these uh, are a little bit better than the in-camera technique. When you're moving the camera or when you're doing it in camera, 
you're changing the focus of the lens, which is causing focused breathing. There's different amounts of light coming in. It's changing the magnification on your subject, depending on the focus breathing. And the technically better way to do this is by moving the camera. So if, if you wanna take this focus stacking just to the very, very highest level, then you might be interested in one of these devices. But for most of us folks, it's not going to be necessary. Now to do this, you're obviously gonna need a tripod because you gotta keep that camera rock solid steady. It helps if you have a remote and then you're gonna need software later on. Now, one of the things you need to be concerned about is focus breathing. This is where there is a notable magnification difference between your lens focused at close up and on infinity. So if you take a look at where this particular lens goes back and forth between close up and infinity, you can see the magnification really change. And this is one that's gonna be a little bit more difficult to work with in this case. And so some tips for doing this is work with non-moving subjects. Make sure your camera's on a tripod. I like being in manual exposure. Have consistent lighting. Have that aperture stopped down, but not too far. And you wanna frame a little bit loose because of that focus breathing in there. And so those are your tips for making this work out right. As far as the software goes, there's a number of different software that will deal with focus stacking at this point. Here are some of the most common ones and what they cost, depending on whether it's a subscription or a buy only. A few of these have different levels where you can get a basic level and a more advanced professional level, depending on how many different attributes you want it. Okay, so there you go, folks. That is focus bracketing. We'll see if we'll uh, take a few questions in here. Um, John, there's only one that's come through for this section, um, which is to use the in-camera function, your lens needs to have autofocus lens. Oh, yep. and autofocus lens. And yes. these new features will not work on a manual focus lens. That is correct. <laughs> yep. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. You need to have your, your autofocus lens turned into the autofocus so that the camera can control focus. All right, that's the only one at this point. Okay, well, we'll move on to our final topic, which is one of my favorite topics, but it's one that may not apply to everybody, but uh, it's good to be aware of all the different options in photography. And tilt shift lenses have been a pet project of mine for the last 10 years. I bought my first one, as I say, about 10 years ago, and I've always known about them. I learned about doing tilts and shifts when I was in college using a large view camera. And I always wanted to do a class on tilt shift lenses. And I finally, I, I had a lot of start, starts and stops over the years. It's been in production for several years, but I finally finished the class and uh, put that out last October or so. So I do have a, a very intense, that's almost seven hours in length on tilt shift lenses. And we're just gonna go through some of the highlights on the tilting aspect of tilt shift lenses here. So tilt, shift lenses are named so for pretty obvious reasons. They're going to be able to tilt. This is to change the plane of focus. You can either maximize or you can minimize the depth of field so you can have more things in focus or less things in focus. Now, most but not all of these lenses will also do perspective control, uh, which is a way of shifting the lens up, down, and to the sides. This can be used for correcting perspective when shooting a building at a low angle, for instance. Uh, it also it can also be used very successfully for doing panorama stitching for creating large megapixel images over a wide area. Now, there are many lenses that will do perspective control that will not do the tilting that we're going to be talking about. So you need to be very clear about what lens you are looking at and what features it has. For the most part, I'm going to be talking about kind of the mainstream Canon and Nikon lenses here as far as what they can do. But there are other brands out there that can work. All right, so in our cameras, we have an imaging plane, we have a lens plane, and then when we focus, we have a focus plane. And with all your normal lenses, your primes and your zooms and your macros and whatever you want, these planes always stay parallel to each other. And as you focus back and forth, that plane of focus moves closer to the camera and further away, and that's all that ever happens. And let's take our apertures out. When we focus with a narrow aperture, 1.4, we're gonna get a very narrow band of focus, of course. If we want to get 
The foreground in focus, well, we've been dealing a lot with this today. We can stop our aperture down. We can move our focus point to that hyperfocal point and get it somewhere between the two. And maybe it reaches and gets enough, but maybe it doesn't quite reach that far. Ah, we'll do focus stacking. Ah, well, we've got flowers blowing in the wind and we can't shoot multiple photos to get everything in focus. Well, how do we really get it in truly sharp focus in one shot? Well, if we tilt the lens, it tilts the plane of the lens. And my logic would say, well, the plane of the focus would tilt an equal amount as the lens plane, but that's not what happens. What happens is it tilts quite a bit more. And I'm taking some liberty, liberties here with my graphics, so cut me a break. I'm gonna get you more exact here in a moment. Uh, the changes your depth of field, the angle that you're shooting and what's in focus, the plane of what is in focus. And now rather than stopping down to F22, which has some diffraction, you can stop down to F8 where your lenses are likely to be much sharper. Now the actual plane that you're gonna get is more of this wedge of focus that's a little bit narrower in the foreground, wider in the background, but if you get it lined up right, you will get the flowers in the foreground, the mountains in the background in perfectly sharp focus. Now you do have to be aware that you are working with a relatively narrow plane of focus, very specific, specifically lined up with what you want. And if one of those flowers or trees or bushes happens to grow up above it, well, it is going to be out of focus and it might look a little funny. You might like the way that looks or you might not, but be aware that we're talking about a flat plane that we're changing. Now the available lenses run a pretty wide range, but they're mostly in the wide angle category. We have our ultra wides, probably what I think is the most practical lens for this, which is the 24. We have a normal lens, and then we have a short telephoto, which a lot of people do this with portrait photography, and then Canon introduced a 135 just to have an additional one there. So the, uh, the ultra wide in my mind is best for architectural work. And so if you're doing interiors, churches, large buildings from the inside, the 17 and 19 is great for that. I find those a little difficult to work with in nature because they're a little bit tougher to filter and it just requires a bigger area that looks really good. I think 24 is the perfect landscape and travel type one, uh, type lens for tilt shift work. Uh, I do have a lot of fun with the 45 and 50 range. If you want just a general purpose lens that can do a lot of different things, I think that's very valuable. Uh, when you get into the 85s and 90s, you're talking a little bit more about product photography. Uh, that can be very good. And the 135, I think, is just an extension on those 85s and 90s and being in product photography, possibly working more with food and in the studio and in that category. So let's take this out of the field to Mount Rainier National Park. Let's take that lens. We're gonna tilt it down. Now, how far do we tilt it down? Well, that is a discussion for my tilt shift class. It goes into way more detail and time than we have here. So uh, there are particulars as to how far you need to tilt it to get the right tilt, to get the foreground subject as well as the background subject in focus. So got a bunch of different images here with different focal lengths. You can see which aperture I'm setting in the upper left-hand corner and what type of movement I am doing with the lens in this case. Most all of these shots are done off of a tripod. They're done with a little bit of setup. This is not real quick, fast acting street photography type stuff. Um, this is gonna be a little bit more uh, careful setup, careful examining, adjusting the lenses, shooting a test shot, and playing those images back and magnifying to make sure that you're getting the everything set up correctly. And when you get it set up correctly, the focus is so sharp from foreground to background. It is just one of my favorite ways of capturing things in a single shot out in the field. And I've been working with, with all of these. As I say, I, I like the 24. I think it's just one of the most practical. I'll bring the 50 around with me uh, if I just wanna bring one lens sometimes where I wanna shoot with shallow depth of field. And there's a way of reversing the tilt to get shallow depth of field, but that once again is a discussion for another time. And what's great about this is that you're shooting at your camera's, or your lens's maximum aperture for sharpness. So everything is just gonna be as sharp as possible. And so when you get a sharp image like this one here, I printed this up poster size and it's in the living room of my house. It is really good. It's, 
you know, medium format quality because we are really getting that focus point set perfectly right. Now, uh, here's a case of vertical video being properly used over on the left. The uh, camera is focused on this petrified log in the foreground, and I'm going to tilt the lens so that I get the background and the rest of the foreground in focus. And you can see this real time in the viewfinder with DSLRs or mirrorless cameras. I've been working with tilt shift lenses mostly with DSLRs. I like the, uh, the clear view through the viewfinder is really nice, but they work well on the mirrorless uh, when you use an adapter. There is nobody that has made a mirrorless tilt shift lens yet. Uh, I'm sure that's gonna change here in the near future, um, but it works well on all the systems. Now I will also use the shifting capability to shift to the left, shift to the right with a tilt forward so that I'm getting the focus right. I'm getting two different images that I can put together in a panorama. And this is getting me incredibly sharp information for focus, but also getting me a ton of pixel information. A lot of times I will set up a shot in horizontal with a tilt forward so that everything's in focus from foreground to the background. And then I'll shift to the left, get a shot there, get another shot in the middle, and then another shot over on the right-hand side. And I will end up with a gigantic sharp image which is a lot of fun to be able to have that much resolution and that much sharpness to work with. Now, uh, using the shift on the lens in a variety of ways, I can shoot four images, if you can think of four corners of a horizontal image. And I am getting even more pixels. With the tilt, I'm getting the sharp, and I end up with an even larger image that's got a little bit more height to it uh, for another style of panoramic. And so tilt shift lenses, that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to them, but that is why some people use them and swear by them as being so great. And so uh, let's uh, see if there's any questions there on the tilt shift lenses. We do have a few, John. Um, so firstly, Tom would like to know how does the tilt work with verticals? Um, because he thinks that the tilt would go in a horizontal plane. So I don't know if you have a tilt shift lens handy. Yeah, let me see if I can get back to my regular screen. Just lucky that I have one of these set aside here. So on this particular lens, there is a knob over here, which let's see if I can loosen this up. There we go. All right, so we can tilt down here. And then I have on this side, I have a little lever down in here where I can leave the lens in that position and rotate the whole camera, or I can rotate the lens and work it in any direction. So the better of the tilt shift lenses will allow you to independently rotate the lens and shift the lens. Let's get this into a normal position here. John, I'm not seeing your screen. I don't know if others are seeing it. Okay. Let's see, I, not sure if I, yes, I, can, I see I it. I can still so. see it, yes. I can see your screen. This is one California. Likewise, I can see it. Okay, good. So, yes, and so if, uh, if it's a good lens, which most of these are, they give you the ability to rotate so that you can do verticals, horizontals. The latest versions of all the Canon ones are great in all that category. With Nikon, I believe they are limited on their 24 and their 45. I believe their 85 gives them kind of a multitude of options for turning it around. I'm not so sure about the 17. I, I forget that one off the top of my head. Great, thanks, John. Um, also, uh, Eddie would like to know if using manual exposure is the same as um, setting your camera on the auto exposure lock to get constant settings? Uh, with tilt shift lenses, I recommend manual exposure with, uh, because what happens is when you start tilting the lens, uh, it's letting in a different amount of light and the auto exposure systems can really throw you off. So I would just steer shy of pretty much all the uh, auto exposure options. And if you are with a DSLR, uh, use the live view. It's very good for previewing what the exposure is going to be. Next up, we've got some questions on lens babies. 
Um, so Lorraine was saying that the lens baby composer plus an optic stopped all the way down to will give you a, a sharp maximum focus. Um, is that the same as just rotating the tilt shift lens? Lens babies are a lot of fun. They're interesting little lenses, uh, but they are in no way a tilt shift lens. Uh, lens babies, if you're not familiar with them, what they do is that they're relatively inexpensive lenses that allow you to have an area of in focus in a particular area, and you can move that area around the frame. And they do so by being able to tilt the lens. And you're not going to be able to do like the landscape shots that I was showing you where you get things in the foreground to the background in focus. That's not how they work. They achieve a similar look as one of the things that you can do in tilt shift lenses. So one of the things that I did not explain to you is you can do a reverse tilt so that there's just this narrow little area in focus and everything else is blown out of focus. Tilt shift lenses allow you to do that uh, on a much, much lower budget, about a one-tenth budget, but it doesn't allow you to do the other things, especially what I explained here. Okay, the next one that we have is um, going back to the focus bracketing, if we could, um, should focus brackets be processed before stacking or after stacking or a combination? I think they should probably be mostly done beforehand. And so you get all your color and contrast adjustments. Uh, framing, you want to leave that a little loose because there's going to be a little bit of slippage, you might say, with focus breathing in there. So that you'll need to fine tune later on. And I think that's all the ones um, that relate to the last couple of sections. Um, I might hand it back over to... Uh, to Vicky. Okay, thank you, Michelle, very much for monitoring the the, Q, the questions. Um, John, I was wondering if you would like to talk a little bit about what's going to happen on February 9th for our part two. All right. Uh, so for February 9th, I am hoping that a whole bunch of you are going to go out and shoot photos using one of the four techniques that I've talked about today. Uh, you all don't need to go out and buy tilt shift lenses to do this. Uh, but if somebody wants to go out and rent one, that's a great way to experiment and see what they can do. Use one of the four techniques in any photo that you want and show us what you got. And we'll see what we can learn from what everybody else does. Thank you, John. Uh, Doug, do you want to speak to how they're going to submit those? Okay. So, uh, when you registered, we captured your email address. So what I will be doing is in the next day or two, well, first of all, make sure that you have registered for part two, if you want to participate in the, in the image critique. Because as you remember, if hopefully you remember from all the flyers that went out that we gave you two links, one for today's uh, webinar, one for the the, the image critique. So make sure you're registered for the image critique. Uh, then what I will do in the, in the next couple of days, I will send an email to everybody who registered for part two uh, with, with the uh, information about how to upload the images. And basically what will happen is that I will invite you to submit to uh, your images to a Dropbox account. You don't need to have Dropbox to do it. You'll just receive a, receive a link. And as uh, several people have asked about the recording, again, the recording will be posted on the N4C YouTube channel. And I will send a link to everybody who registered for part one, but you can also go to our YouTube channel using the link that's in the screen. Any questions? I see that someone asked, can we attend part two without submitting? Yes, you certainly can attend part two and hear the critiques on the other people's images, but you get the most value, of course, if you submit your, your own images. Uh, 
with the number of people who are registered, we might have to say, uh, let's start out with just one image per person. And depending on how many people submit, we might be able to open it up, open it up further. Um, John, when would you like to have things submitted by so you have time to look at them? Oh, I'm quick. I can just view them the day of. <laughs> we'll probably set a deadline of uh, a day or two before the scheduled meeting. Give that would be good, to... probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you, if, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but in the chat, uh, Michelle has posted links to John's website and uh, access to his classes and books, and you can sign up for a free newsletter from him. Um, hey, Vicki, um, uh, if I could just uh, let people know a little bit more about the stuff that's available. Sure. Let me uh, see if I can go back to share this screen. So for those that don't know, I do have a monthly newsletter. You can go to my website and sign up for that. And uh, there's a new article each month. And there's announcement about new classes and other things that are going on. I do have a couple of books available if you're old school and like to have that paper copy in front of you. So more about the focus that we talked about today. And then another one on exposure as well. I do make a lot of different classes. And I am happy to make the public announcement right here and right now about the newest class, which is called Photography Essentials, which is a core photography class. It's not really a beginner class, but yeah, beginners would be great to take this class. And this is uh, really going to focus in on the important elements. And I've got some things in here that I've not presented in any other class. And so being one of my essentials classes, uh, we don't waste a lot of time. It's, it's, it's a concise class. It, it hits home on all the heavy points that you're going to be using in all your other photography. I do also have a nice composition class and that tilt shift class that we talked about. And as many of you know, I do make classes on all the latest, greatest cameras. And I have many more classes. There's a lot of uh, very hot cameras out now. And I will be making classes in many of those. And so if you want to learn how to use your camera, I do make these very, very, very in-depth tutorials. They're usually seven to eight hours, and they will let you know how everything works on your particular camera. And if you are in uh, the market for a new camera, I do have a free buyer's guide. Uh, as many of you know, I don't do reviews, and so I don't review each camera. I really don't care which camera is better than the other one, but I do want to help people find the right camera for what they want to do. And so if you want to see a completely unbiased overview of the photography market, you can get the 2022 Camera Buyer's Guide. That's out and it's all up to date because uh, we've got lots of new cameras coming out and they're all accounted for in this buyer's guide. So all of this can be found at my website as well as the ability to sign up to the newsletter. And so that's my little plug for the end of the show. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. I, I think we all took a lot of info in today and I'm excited to go out and try a couple of things now and hope to send you something for the, for the review. So I think we're getting a whole, we're getting a whole lot of thank yous in the, in the chat room. Um, yeah. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Anything, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, nope. Thanks a lot for everybody tuning in. I know there's a lot of people from your club. I think I had a few people from kind of my my group of people and we had a big group here and that was great to have. So thanks a lot, everybody, for taking time out. Appreciate you being here. Thank okay, you, John. Michelle. Yep. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you had anything else, Doug. Nope. Nothing else for me. Just thanks to everybody to attending. I hope you see it, to see you at future webinars. Yep. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. See you soon.